Hello and welcome to another episode of Flying High with Flutter. I'm your host, Alan Wyma. I just want to give another quick shout out in case you don't know, but we have our course already up in pre-launch. If you go to rustwithflutter.com, you will see uh, we have our course already up there and it's currently in pre-launch as we're creating the content. We have the first module up and I'm currently working on the second module. And so if you're interested to know how to integrate uh, Rust and Flutter together, I highly recommend you check it out. That's rustwithflutter.com. And now back to the show, we have Maurice Parrish with us. He is a software engineer on the uh, Flutter team, and he's got quite an interesting story. So let me go ahead and let you talk about yourself and what you do on the Flutter team. Go ahead. Yeah, so for my role on the Flutter team, I work on Flutter plugins, mostly developing them, maintaining them, testing them, um, uh, fixing bugs, and things like that. And essentially, the plugins that I specifically work on, and I've worked on in the past, was like Firebase. I worked on WebView plugin. I worked on Camera, uh, Google Maps, Google Mobile Ads, and things like that. I've worked on setting up architecture for them to where uh, to help them expand like multiple platforms, and essentially just all along those works. Just anything that's plugin related for Flutter that I, I pretty much have worked on, and I've worked on like a large portion of the plugins that we support. Uh, Officially by Google. So, what what's your favorite plugin uh, out of all the plugins that you worked on? Uh, my favorite plugin, personally, is the camera plugin because it's uh, one of the most complex plugins, especially across platforms. We're working on an Android and iOS and across web. And coming up with like an interface that works across all platforms is very interesting because the the APIs across each one is like so very different that trying to you know, create a platform for that is like a very complicated problem. Um, you also get to work with things like uh, image processing. Um, the work that I did in there also affected like ML Kit, and a lot of people got a use out of that, where you can like take a picture and then like scan a document, get all the text from it, and like scanning faces and things like that. So it's just like a huge application for what Camera does, and having that creating a plugin to where that works across platforms, and you just write the code once is really interesting. Yeah, that does sound pretty great. I'm wondering if the web is using WebRTC or something like that. Is it? To, to capture things or just kind of native? There's something built into the browser to just grab the camera? I think it depends on, yeah, I think it depends on the browser. I didn't get to work on the websites because my expertise is mostly in like Android and iOS. Um, but I think it's something that's built in and it depends on like whether you're using Chrome or Safari or something like that. Oh, really? So this is actually like, I'm kind of curious also about the limitations because web is kind of like a little bit fragmented if you even compare. I mean, for Android and iOS, yeah, there's some fragmentation, but I think it's much more fragmentation for the web because each browser is quite different and you just need to be able to render HTML, CSS, but having in camera capabilities, USB capabilities, these kind of things are a little bit niche, I think, in comparison because people using them is quite little, I think. Um, sorry, what was the question? You just asking about no, the I was just curious. Well? I was just curious about like, yeah, how, how would that work? Because like I noticed it like uh, uh, in, my, in, my, in my previous experience uh, working with the web is like, uh, you know, if you're going to use IE, you, they have similar capabilities, but you have to use this kind of JavaScript API. And if you want to use uh, Chrome and the other ones, it's like this one. And sometimes, like, even Safari itself is, like, doesn't exactly support everything. I think it's kind of famous for, like, the push notifications that are supported within Chrome. It's like they, they work well, but then, like, within Safari, maybe they don't exactly work, at least on the iOS side for, for the browser. Yeah, so for me, personally, I haven't worked that much on web. But I think for how they deal with fragmentation is that they just basically just support a JavaScript API. And it's mainly because like Dart can, uh, if I'm correct, they should be able to co compile down the JavaScript. So they just use whatever available there. And then whatever browser supports that, they'll support that. And they'll probably, um, if, the, if a certain browser doesn't support it, then they'll use like the lowest common denominator and have like certain features work in certain ways. But I know that all the features that support it on like Android and iOS also show up in web specifically. Uh, for WebView plugin as well, because it, it, there's just not everything is supported across all platforms. I think another, so since you don't have that much experience in web, and that's fine, an mm -hmm. even more interesting one is like, if you're looking at like Android, some of these Android phones, I mean, you don't really know what kind of camera they're going to have. Like they could have like mm -hmm. a real bad camera. Like how do you handle something like that? Like again, it's the lowest common denominator and Android kind of uh, helps to settle that for you or how does that work? So what we try to do is try to offer like customizability for, uh, we have like, like prefix, uh, preset settings to where you can get like low or like medium or high. And we just look at the device, look for all like, like resolutions. And then we just choose like the lowest, the medium and the highest. 
And then we just provide that. And then we just tell you what these values are. And then a person can just use that for, I guess, for any Android device. And but they'll be like, they'll have different resolutions for when they record uh, videos or take pictures or things like that. Um, I'm also thinking about like, in the new version of iOS, they have like some kind of, I don't know what you call that, like filtering or something. Uh, like the way that you can have like voice isolation, things like that. I'm curious about this kind of stuff. I guess you can have some custom, like maybe let's kind of roll it back a little bit. Like if there's some kind of custom thing that iOS has, like I guess you can add some kind of special API that only gets used. Um, you know what I mean? Like a kind of, kind of custom mm -hmm. flag or something like that. Is that how you'd handle something yeah. like this? So that goes into things like plugin architecture. And that's currently what we're working on right now, especially with the WebView plugin as we were trying to come up with a solution that we can, uh, like an architecture for, for all our, at least our plugins. And hopefully we write the documentation that all other plugins can use. It's the, the federated plugin model. And what that does is that it makes it very easy to not only have uh, like a platform interface and then it works on multiple platforms, but then also it'll provide access to like platform specific features with the use of like casting and using use of factories, basically just like Dart language features, and we can. It's a basic way to where you just have a, a platform interface where like all the platforms support these, and then you just do like a if iOS and you like cast iOS, and then you like set like like a specific flag um, that iOS might have or something like that. Uh, maybe yeah. Can you talk more about this federated plugin because I feel like mm -hmm. it's not really talked too much about. I know there's documentation on the website, mm -hmm. but. Not many people read that, and I'm definitely guilty of not reading the the, the <laughs> documentation on the Flutter website. Like, yeah. uh, what what brought about this this first of all, what brought about this change? And then, like, if I'm a if I'm somebody who's interested in writing a plugin, how would I start off my my plugin if I want to make it federated? And why would I want to make it federated? So the history of federated plugins started because originally when we were working on Flutter, at least when I was running the team, our main focus was just Android and iOS. That's the only two platforms that we originally supported. But then we had the idea that the portability of like how Flutter works and with Skia, which is the 2D rendering engine and using that is OpenGL on a lot of, a lot of platforms is that you can actually have it work for Windows and you have it work for web. You can have it work for Linux. Uh, uh, and so what we wanted to do with that is to, uh, create a, an art, a plugin architect architecture that uh, makes it easy to add uh, new platform implementations for a plugin. So that's essentially what his role and essentially so after we were supporting Android and iOS, uh, I think people on Fuchsia wanted support and then I think people on Windows and we had people who work on like Linux on our team, they thought they, they could do a portability of this and they wanted to create support for plugins very easily. So that's what created it. And for a person to get started in like federated plugins, there's a plugin called a uh, plugin platform interface, which goes through the details of how you should structure your plugin. Um, and it's like in the readme of this documentation and you can find it on pub.dev. Um, and essentially that would be like the best place to start. But currently what we're working on is we're working on better documentation so we can have like a full, uh, let's see, what's the word? Uh, basically a full walkthrough to explain like how to federate a plugin and best practices um, along with would have like code generation with it as well um, and a lot of, like annotations and things like that to improve the quality of it. And that's currently what we're in the process of doing is like the WebView plugin. But at, at the currently, as I said earlier, the best way to start would be like the plugin platform interface and that'd be the first place to start if someone wants to do it. So I noticed when I create a plugin now, it, it seems like it's already federated, I think, because I think one of the pieces of federation is that it has to have like this whole section. Let me look at inside the pubspec.yaml. Oh, yeah. If you scroll down, yeah, there's Flutter plugin and then there's platforms where you start listing off platforms. Is this, uh, this is how you actually start federating a plugin, right? This is one uh, of the pieces. Yeah. So how, uh, how that works is that you have a platform interface, a dedicated like, uh, Flutter package just as the platform interface and then you create your plugin, and then what you have is you have plat uh, platform interface implementations, and then what you have is like endorsed implementations, which means you put in your pub spec of your plugin that this is like an official implementation of like for Android. So like for uh, WebView Flutter plugin, 
There's a WebView Flutter Android plugin and a WebView Flutter WK WebView uh, plugin. And for WebView Flutter, we'd say that the endorsed implementations for Android is the WebView Flutter Android and the endorsed one for iOS is the WebView Flutter WK WebView. But what Federated Plugin Models does is that even if it's not officially endorsed, you can add, uh, if someone, some third party uh, developer wanted to add support for Windows for like WebView Flutter, they could still add their own platform interface. It just wouldn't be officially endorsed or included in the uh, the plugin without importing another uh, plugin implementation. Wait, I'm still trying to understand this. So, because I, I know that like a lot of the a lot of the popular plugins like URL Launcher, I think, is actually split up again in a bunch of different packages. So when you pull mm. it in, you're getting different packages, right? Yeah. So yeah, I so, can explain yeah how yeah, that's confusing for me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. If you're looking at, uh, let's start with like URL launcher is a good one. Uh, so you, you'll essentially have, if you're supporting two platforms, you essentially have like four plugins. Um, the first plugin that you will have is called, it would be URL launcher platform interface. And what this does is just a uh, platform agnostic interface that uh, any platform can essentially implement. Uh, it's basically usually just dark code. Uh, so that it, can, so it like doesn't really actually do anything. It's just like code that, uh, is, can be implemented by another platform. So after that, you'd create a, a plugin called URL Launcher, uh, Android. And what that will do, it'll be an implementation of the URL Launcher platform interface. And then you do the same thing for URL Launcher iOS, which is just an iOS implementation of URL launcher platform interface. And that stuff will have like platform specific code. So the Android one would have Java code. The uh, iOS one would have Objective C or Swift, depending on what you want to use. Then on top of that, you'd have one more plugin called URL launcher. And what the URL launcher does is that it, uh, it takes in, um, the, uh, the platform interface and then it, endorses the URL launcher Android and URL launcher iOS as like official implementations of the platform interface. And the, the URL launcher plugin is what the user would actually be dealing with. Um, in terms of like, is the user facing uh, API that someone would do it. The, the other stuff is more underlying code that, uh, is where like more like platform specific code would live and implementation specific to a platform might live. Sure so this is confusing. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I'm listening to you and I'm also, as mm. you can see my eyes, I'm wandering at the plugins right now. Mm. So this is interesting. Maybe you can explain this to me one. This URL launcher platform interface, I opened up the pubspec.yaml file, but mm. it also lists that plugin, a uh, plugin platform interface. Sorry, I thought I also said that itself was the dependency. I was getting a little bit confused. Okay, so you have this platform interface. Um, so let's say I only wanted to like use I only want to use URL Launcher for iOS. I didn't want to develop any other type of app. Can mm -hmm. I just say that I want to depend on URL Launcher iOS, or I have to say URL Launcher no matter what? Um, so you could do it without federating it, but it's not as uh, encouraged because in the future, someone who wants it to work on Android might want to create a uh, might want to implement their own platform interface, and if you don't federate it, it makes it very difficult to do that, which is the main reason. We did that because someone wanted to create uh, their own platform implementation of that, uh, of a, a plugin that we were supporting. So you could for, if you wanted to do iOS, yeah, I would still encourage doing the platform interface because um, it could save time in the long run because in case you change your mind or someone else wants support for it. But um, essentially the process would still be the same, even if it's, you're just supporting like one platform where you have the platform interface, and then platform interface iOS, and then the, um, and then the uh, the name of the plugin, um, URL launcher or web or something. Yeah, okay, again, I'm looking through everything. I don't see anything yeah. in here in particular that says about the platform interface, other than it requires the, the platform interface as a uh, as something about URL launcher platform interface. I don't see anything here about it saying. Like like the Flutter plugin platforms, right? That's all very mm. clear. Okay, if I see if I'm using Android, I have to say the default package is URL launcher Android. But I don't see anything here about the platform interface in particular, other than it's being a dependency. So because I mark it as a dependency, that's automatically going to be included, and I have to use this one, and it uses that for something. I'm just still trying to wrap my head around this. Yeah. For the which pub spec are you currently looking at? Are you looking at URL um, launcher or URL platform interface? 
Well, I looked at URL launcher first mm-hmm. because that one's kind of the mother, right? That if you once you, you include that all, then I'm guessing that it starts going through the pub spec and saying, okay, I need all these other ones because I need all these other platforms, right? Mm-hmm. So if I roll back and I look at uh, platform interface and I look at the pub spec, I don't think there's going to be anything in here that really makes me understand about like why this, what's the point of this one, right? I don't see anything in here that really makes that clear to me as somebody who's interested in this kind of stuff. So for a platform interface, it's kind of a standalone package. It really doesn't depend on anything besides a plugin platform interface. And really the code doesn't actually do anything because something has to implement it for it to actually do anything, especially on Android. It has to use like method channels to communicate to the Java to do something. Otherwise the code just like will just throw an error that says there's no implementation. Um, if you look in the pub spec of URL launcher, you should see like the list of platforms and then default package. And that basically just shows, uh, basically all the implementations of for like Android and iOS. Um, let's see, they have Linux, Mac OS, web and windows. And those are like the implementations that are in like the same folder. And then the platform interface is just something that they all just implement. And then, so let's say you want to say you want to open a URL. I think it's called open URL. I'm not sure what the methods are in URL launcher is. Essentially each, uh, like URL launcher Android and URL launcher iOS, URL launcher web all implement that method. So when you like start up, uh, the URL, when you add the URL launcher to your application, then it will just decide based on what platform you're using. And then we'll call the implementation based on, uh, like pub spec will like set it up for you. I'm not sure it might be a better. Yeah, I'm because yeah. I'm just looking at all this. I definitely I only mm. just see native code for iOS, right? So mm. I'm just trying to understand how the glue of this thing works. Yeah, we definitely need better, probably uh, better documentation, better visuals for it. Um, but since we, yeah, I'm trying to find if we have like a good image that explains. It. I think that's yeah part of the reason that we're still working on we're, we're working on with web, web view Flutter is that we're trying to create better documentation for it and then a better example of it to see about how they do it or to see it like a better way for like the community to start um, adopting this pattern more often. Uh, but currently, yeah, it's basically, you can basically spit it on layers. It's basically just a plugin interface. Then you have the implementation uh, that, uh, that implements the plugin interface. And then you have the actual plugin, which uses the implementation and then like, we'll like call the method from the interface and then, then flutter will handle calling the implementation from the right platform so if i go to create a, a plugin now i can actually mm-hmm. create a plugin and have all of my implementations of the native platforms in each folder in the same plugin folder to me it just seems very complicated if i have to if i split out all the things in different folders and different packages or am I am I wrong? I just feel like very complicated because now I'm separating my interface from my implementation. And is there really a benefit to have this separated like that? Um, so yeah, that is a possible alternative to where you don't have separate folders for implementation, to where you just have, um, like, I think I think alternative structure is that I was trying was to where you could that you don't need uh, separate implementation folders. You'd still most likely need, uh, like something like a URL launcher. And then you'll need another folder for, uh, something like if you're using WebView Flutter, you do have something like WebView Flutter Android. And you'd still need that because you'd want to put all your code specifically for Android in there because you'll want to add all the platform specific stuff. Um, so that's why you kind of don't want to put it all in one model plugin. And especially it helps when people don't want to download. Uh, like all the plugins to, or all the platforms to use a plugin because that, that, that can like slow down uh, a compilation or something along those lines. Um, so like if you only cared about Android, then you'd also, then you'd actually also download iOS and web and Linux and all those other platforms that you're not using. So it's kind of separating it will only pull like what you're, what you would need. Okay. I see. Uh, yeah, otherwise all that dark code would still exist in your plugin. But if you only use like a specific platform, then only your specific platform would exist 
If you're going to be using multiple platforms, though, let's say you're just making a plugin just for yourself. I mean, because mm. if you go to like if you go to like uh, IntelliJ or Android Studio, you say file, new project. You can select the type to be a plugin. Select mm-hmm. all the platforms that you want to implement, and then click finish. Then you're going to get uh, all those all those like platforms right in the same folder, and then you have mm-hmm. your implementation right there for each different platform, and also the interface that you want to design. And it's a little bit, to me, it's a little bit more kind of clear, like I said, because everything's all together. But I, I can see that, like, yeah, separating things is kind of a little bit more modular. And then we were also hinting earlier that you said that you can actually, like, somehow replace or augment existing implementations. Or did I maybe misunderstand what you're saying? Oh, uh, yeah, you can. You don't have to do it exactly like this. Um, so the endorsing one is the one that we encourage right now, but obviously that's still, we're still doing that a work in progress. So I'd still recommend it as we still experiment with Buggy Flutter. Um, so you could do the, uh, you could do a way to where what I've tried, um, um, as, uh, an experiment is to essentially just have, there's no separate plugin interface plugin. And what you could do is just have like a WebView Flutter and then you have a WebView Flutter Android. And what all WebView Flutter Android does, it simply just mirrors the Android API. So let's so you basically just like have access to WebView, web settings, just very basically it's just a connection to you're just providing the Dart uh the, the Java API in Dart code. And then you'd have like a platform implementations inside just WebView Flutter uh, and things like that. And you wouldn't have to do things like with endorsing in the lines along along those lines. But still, a work in progress to see how like how that affects how that affects people, how that affects with modularity, uh, how that affects like testing and things like that. So I can't specifically endorse it right now, but that could be a potential solution that might be easier for people to um, easier for people to implement if it that's a path that they want to do. Because it's it'd still be so, somewhat federated. It's just not in the same way that we're currently um, doing it. Okay, but I think it's also good to talk about what uh, there's actually a difference between a plugin and a package, right? Uh, so a plugin is just like uh, the, a package is just like pure dark code, and a plugin is something that contains like platform specific code, such as like Java or Objective C. That's the only real difference. Okay, yeah, that's because I think that's people always get that kind of confused, and it's it's definitely not not very uh, straightforward. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, people often use them pretty interchangeably. And technically, a plugin is still a package. Um, it's just a, like a package plus like object, like platform specific code. So, um, yeah, there's definitely the wording on it definitely can be confusing um, in a lot of contexts. Now, if I wanted to support like a custom platform, right, because we have yeah. the ability to port this engine around, how can I add like a plugin to this kind of thing? Like I, somehow I can just say, just define a platform. And then I could just say, okay, in my YAML for my pubspec.yaml file, I could just make the, put the, put the name in there and it's ready to go. Yeah. So all you would have to do. So that's like the, the, that was the goal of the federated plugins. Essentially we can go back to like URL launcher as an example. Let's say you want to support, um, Ar- Arduino or something like that. You could just create a plugin called URL launcher Arduino. You would depend on URL launcher, uh, platform interface. And then you would essentially, there'd be a class called URL launcher platform interface. Uh, that would be a class inside of like a, the plugin, the package called URL launcher pl- platform interface. You would implement that. And then when you're using the URL launcher plugin, um, then you would cha- call a method called, um, URL launcher, um, I think it's there's a I think it's a field called dot platform. I have to check again. But to then you would change it to your platform implementation essentially. So I guess a better way to explain it is that there's a class called uh URL launcher platform interface, and then you can implement it with whatever platform you wanted to, and then just change that value um in URL launcher. So I don't know if I actually implement my interface correctly, right? Because it's actually separated out. Is there a way that we can test this with the automated test? Or is it something I just have to run the example project and see if it runs okay? Um, so, yeah, so there should be integration tests in like your launcher and you could run it with your platform. Um, if you uh, know how to run like Flutter Drive or integration tests from that, yeah. Do you just set up your own platform and then just run those tests and see if it works properly? 
I'm actually kind of curious, is, is Flutter looking to start adding in uh, ways to write automated tests for plugins? Because that, I think, is uh, definitely something that would be nice to have, but I don't know if that's actually a possible way to do. Um, so when you say automated testing, are you talking about like things like integrated te integration tests? Or are you talking about like where tests like already exist that you can like run for like a plugin or something along those lines? I'm thinking more like a uh, unit test to begin with, but I think automate, I mean, uh, the integration test is something different, right? You can probably yeah. do that, I'm guessing. But the mm -hmm. unit testing is something I'm more interested in. So unit testing for plugins is kind of hard for platforms because you actually have to communicate with like an actual platform. Like you can't run unit tests with like just Dart code because you would need an actual Android device. So you'd have to use integration tests in this manner. Um, but then you can, you can just like write a code integration test that works. If you work, wrote the tests and they worked on Android and then you, someone can write an implementation for like iOS or Arduino or web. And then since the, yeah, you can make sure that your implementation works correct. Like we currently have a way with, um, uh, for WebView Flutter, for example, we have a test that tests is scrolling and make sure that like your, uh, WebView scrolls properly. Um, so when we like eventually like we're trying, considering adding support for like web for that. When you add the support for web and you run the integration test, that can make sure that the behavior on web acts the same way on Android and iOS. Yeah. Um, I'm also trying to think, I think there's also some restrictions like on iOS and stuff where you have to actually enable certain settings to make things work. I remember like the mm -hmm. URL plugin, you have to actually add in the scheme for even HTTPS. That was like something that uh, caught me initially when I was using mm -hmm. it. So, um, I don't know if there's any kind of ways to kind of catch this kind of stuff. I'm guessing probably not. If there's oh. something special to do for WebKit or something. For, sorry, for the WebView. Oh, so for WebView, if you're talking about like the different URL schemes, yeah, that's something we've discussed about like what's the best way to do that is either, um, cause in a lot of places we just pass a string and then whatever the platform, then, then we just see whatever the platform does. And if it's, uh, uh, fails on one platform and not the other, then the, at least the, User will get the error and then they'll see like what, what's wrong with like why they're, why the thing's not working on that specific platform. But obviously you want things to work across different platforms. So I think a solution there is potentially we're looking in a way to where we can create like a cross platform URL that we do in Dart that tries to mirror what, uh, the, the, the scheme verification in the Dart side. So a person can see. Uh, what does and doesn't work um, basically on the dark side without it needing to be connected to a platform. So you can do it like test it with like unit tests and things like that. Um, but yeah, that's a very difficult problem when it's just basically, especially since uh, Flutter is made by Google. So we don't really have access to necessarily how uh, uh, Apple's system works for URLs. So a lot of times it's more just like trial and error and hopefully. Uh, if this URL doesn't work, then okay, then we'll start looking for error and throwing bugs on the dark side uh, when someone passes in something correct. Is there any times where you guys just start filing bugs to Apple to fix certain things, or have you ever run into something like that? Um, I think uh, I, I know someone on the on at least people who work on the framework or the engine side have. On the plugin side, we don't. File, I guess files many bugs with, um, I guess external APIs for like, especially for like iOS. We usually just, usually there's a bug that you can point to, um, that's already like talked about on either somewhere on GitHub or Stack Overflow. And it's like not something that's wrong with the plugin specifically. Let me just say, Hey, this is not something that we're doing. We're communicating the right parameters to the method that you're calling, but there's just a bug that we don't have control of. And here's like the link to this issue. Oh, yeah, I know I ran into some issues with iOS recently where things were working fine, but between patch releases, they just busted. I don't know what, what happened. It was a little bit of a disaster <laughs> for iOS. Android's been pretty smooth, actually. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it happens. Yeah, it's hard to prevent uh, regressions all the time. I've only had one issue where like, I was using this plugin called Catcher, and I think it was an upgrade to Android X, and, then, and eventually it just busted on me one day. Mm -hmm. And it kept breaking, and I had no idea why my app was breaking. And then finally, after just removing plugins after a while, then I ran into the line where I was initializing Catcher or something at a certain time. And the funny part mm -hmm. was, like, it was ironic because Catcher is supposed to, like, report crashes. But at the mm -hmm. same time, when I was using it to, to kind of initialize, it was actually crashing. Uh, so I couldn't okay. even catch what it was crashing <laughs> about. 
This is very yeah. ironic. Yeah, yeah. That's a yeah, very funny situation. Yeah, the the when the bug catcher uh like crashes. I think yeah, I remember that whole transition um to Android X as well. Um that was, yeah, that was a long process because we we also struggled uh moving everything to Android X for like photo plugins and across the framework and everything along those lines. So I definitely yeah, remember similar bugs when uh working on plugins like I think like a couple of years ago when we were doing that transition. But it seems like I think the Android X one seemed like that was a multi year issue of just people that because you had also asked people, can you please upgrade your mm-hmm. plugins? But I felt like this new like I think the second migration is definitely this null safety stuff. And that one has been rather smooth in comparison. Yeah. You don't feel the same? Um, yeah, I definitely agree. I think it's based on like how much we can control what we can, uh, what is contained. Like for um, Android X, it's like very um, varied uh, depending on like Android devices and Android versions about what's supported. So it's a lot, I guess, a lot harder for us to, we, we don't really have a whole lot of control over that. And then there's like a lot of things with like Gradle as well that we have to do like workarounds and we have to support older versions, especially with the issue where we were supporting all the way back to Android like 16 and we wanted to keep moving forward. But you, you also want to make sure you support Android X and you don't want to call bugs. And then we don't uh, expose a lot of stuff to the user because with flutter it's like cross-platform so we handle a lot of like like gradle and compilation issues and things like that so that yeah that, that took us yeah quite a bit to fix but eventually we were able to get workarounds and a lot of libraries weren't compatible especially with older versions and things like that but with like null safety it's like just dart um and then the dart team did something awesome where they had like things that you get automatic like automatically fix i think it's dart fix that automatically fixes that stuff for you um and it's uh yeah, it's a lot more contained of a chain than something like Android X, which is something that's not directly user facing, and there's no necessarily that many tools for automation that works that well with Flutter. Like the tool, like there, I know the Android team made tools to convert an Android app to Android X, but the things when you use Flutter, like it wasn't designed to work with Flutter and how we set up our uh, compilation for apps. So I think that's what caused the problems. Yeah, I also find it kind of interesting. It's like you can just use Flutter Create again within the same project, and that would just like recreate files. And like if you just remove mm-hmm. things and just said Flutter Create, it would just somehow build up files that you needed. It just didn't quite make sense to me. Yeah, so you th- so much of it is like code generated and things like that. Especially when you run like PubKit and you have plugins and it uh, have like the generated plugin registrant, and then like it'll set up like Gradle for you. So it's often like pretty beneficial to like sometimes just remove the the non Remove the code that you didn't write yourself and then just run Flutter Crates to make sure that it still runs. We run a, we actually test a lot of our plugins by doing that as well. Um, to make sure that things are like up to date along those lines because it's, um, moving at the, like, we have to keep up with the date with like Android and iOS and like web and Windows and things like that. So you would often sometimes have breaking changes, um, outside the realm of like Dart packages and things like that. How does the Flutter team figure out like which plugins they want to maintain, which ones they don't want to maintain? Um, so we decide based on um, the importance um, of internal customers, um, external customers for people, and based on popularity from GitHub issues. So we basically do like based on like the number of thumbs up for issues for what we support. So if something has like a lot of, like a plugin has like a lot of issues, then we'll start working more on start, start putting more resources into like fixing bugs or adding features to specific issues. And then the specific customer external or internal has like a specific feature request. that's like, like let's say it's like breaking or it's like uh, something that they they can't launch without it, then we'll focus on solving those problems or adding features for that specific plugin. Okay, that 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 makes sense. Mm-hmm. But there's also some things you guys just want to touch, right? Is there must be something that you're just saying, okay, we just don't want to get into this field. Um, there's nothing anything that we have like a policy against touching. It's just that it's that we just have a limited amount of resources. Um, we try to. Anything that's like officially supported by like Android and iOS, that's something we would have 
an interest. Those would be the highest priorities that we do want to support, uh, which is why we support like, you know, URL launcher. Um, and there's things that are like critical to like plugin development. Like is why we have like Firebase is like like Firebase off and things like that. Google sign in. Um, WebView is like very one of the most popular plugins, and then things that are like uh, essential, such as I think Video Player is also very popular. Um, um, device Info is also very popular. So it's just based on like if you're running a plugin, it's like we can't launch without this, then we'll try to support it with, uh, with as many resources as we can. But obviously, we're, we're still we're still just a limited team, and we're still working on the design to make this process easier. Um, to where we could support a larger range of plugins with out as much work. And the, part of that goes part into investing into like the federated plugins and also code generation as well. So eventually we'll have like a lot easier streamlined process. Uh, but you guys don't actually support, um, the Apple sign in, right? Because that one's kind of a little bit required nowadays. If you want to have third party login. Um, I, I think we do, yeah, I don't know if we support it. I think someone ended up supporting it third party and, and it was a, like a decent plugin. So it wasn't um, a high priority for us to do Apple sign in, um, at least not right off the back, um, mainly because like, someone came out with one, like, I think like a decently quality one, like very quickly. Yeah, let's see. It's also, yeah, it's also a Flutter favorite as well. So that means what a Flutter, Flutter favorite is, is that we, our team reviews external uh, plugins and we just look through the code and the tests and the infrastructure and things like that. And it turns out that the one that uh, a third party developer made uh, was pretty high quality by our standards. So we marked it as Flutter favorite. So there's no, and we don't really want to step over the community because we want to encourage people to build plugins for Flutter as well. So obviously we reviewed the code, thought it was good, and just thought we don't, there's no need for us to really write an officially supported one at the moment. Is there any plans to bring a uh, Flutter plugin that's more platform specific, like multi window support within desktop? Um, I'm curious if that is like multi window support. I wonder if that would even be a plug need need to be a plugin that might be something that the engine might provide but there are plenty of examples of like platform specific plugins um so there's definitely um no doubt that we could support it if it was like very if it was like a very high requested plugin um or like someone one of our customers really uh said they really needed it for something that they were working on yeah there's there's probably no reason that we wouldn't have some resources into it and in but there, yeah, but there are also currently, I think, um, Android Alarm Manager, which is like background execution code, is like something that runs in the, that's specifically only for like Android. Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy with most of the plugins coming from, from, uh, from the ecosystem. Yeah, I've, I've already used the uh, Apple sign in one, but that one I was surprised it wasn't taken up by Apple, uh, or sorry, it wasn't taken up by you guys because it was pretty critical. Apple just said, mm -hmm. okay, you cannot have any third party login unless you have sign in with Apple. Yeah. Like, forget about it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think we were talking about it and someone just got to it before us and we're just like, well, we don't want to like just a step on them because that would discourage people from writing their own plugins. So we just reviewed it ourselves and thought it was um, good enough. Um, so yeah. So that's basically the, the story of how we basically just, uh, just let up. We're allowed to like a third party developer to take it and we didn't uh, really need to. And it also shows like how much support the, uh, Flutter community has for um, like major features like that and how important it was. Now, do you guys ever take over any plugins that maybe get abandoned or not updated as quickly as maybe people actually need? Um, I have no recollection of ever us taking over a plugin from a third party. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I, nothing from my memory that we've ever taken over like a third party uh, plugin. Um, but we have also, um, some of our plugins, uh, we now, the community has taken over is like the, it's the plus community dot dev plugins, uh, that I think some of our plugins are now just owned by like, uh, the Flutter community in, instead of, instead of us, because they were doing, uh, a good job with it. And then we went to focus more on our core plugins, like WebView. Oh, is that mean like that's, uh, like device info plus, right? That one I saw yeah. is called plus. So anything with the underscore plus at the end is part of the plus community, which is actually community driven. Yeah. 
Okay, I had, I had no idea. I just started seeing a bunch of plugins called Plus. And I didn't really think too much about it. I just thought, okay, maybe this is just a replacement for, or or it's just the original one plus some extra features. Yeah, yeah. I think for the Plus one, I think most of them are. I think as long as they're they should be Flutter favorited, then yeah, they're like our plugins, and then they added more features and better support and more um, CI and testing for it. Um, so then, literally, you guys just kind of pass over the source code and let the let the plus community handle this yeah yeah and essentially and we reviewed the code as well to make sure it's, it's high quality and then we yeah allowed them to i guess to decide the side the direction and we just make sure that the it's still high quality as we continue going we just don't actively develop into it no uh, that's that's pretty cool but how do you actually get into the, yeah. to that plus community if you're like somebody who really wants to like work on these plugins I'm not entirely sure. I think they allow anyone to commit and then they have like um, just maintainers to do it. I'm not it's officially sure. I think someone on our team, um, I think possibly Chris, if you talk to him, is that he probably knows like uh, some of the people in there and how they uh, vet people who who can like push push PRs and things like that. But for me, I'm not really, really sure. Uh, now I'm also kind of curious too. Like, if if I'm interested in running a Flutter plugin, right now, do you do you recommend that like I really take quite a lot of time to study all the native code so I can really be good at this, or can I like somehow figure my way around, right? If I wanted to to write something, um, it's usually better to. I think it depends on how you're writing your plugin. Um, how we're trying to write them now is that you could probably probably figure it out as you go, but right now the more important issue is more like i guess the arch architecture and um and how you structure your code the, the main issue that you you deal with when you deal with like uh plugins is two main things it's mainly um maintaining access to specific classes so like let's say you're doing something with like a camera like you have to keep access to the camera on the java side in memory and then you have to Basically, when you make calls from Dart, then you have to access it. And same thing along those lines. If like in like, uh, I think a better example is actually probably video player. Video player where like each video instance, because you could have multiple on the screen or multiple loaded. So you have to keep those both in like a map in on the, uh, the platform side, either Java or Objective-C. Um, and that kind of like resource management can be kind of a headache if you don't really understand the API that much because some things need to be kept in memory, some things can be disposed. Some things are just like data classes. So that's kind of something you have to plan out before. But with the work with the, like the federated plugin model, we're trying to hopefully combine that with like a uh, code generation to where a lot of that's handled for you. So you can do a lot less serialization, a lot less of so memory management stuff. Um, so I guess that's, that's I guess that's a long answer to where right now you probably should have a pretty thorough understanding of it because it will be hard just to get through it with the current tools. But in the future, we want to be able to make that process uh, a lot easier. Yeah, I think I remember some talk about this a, a while back that people were saying that you could just somehow write some dark code and then there's a way to code generate something. I, I think I think now I'm, I'm starting to come to my mind like you, it, but it can only generate Java and Objective C, but not Swift and Kotlin. Yeah, so that's I think you're referring to as Pigeon. Um, right now, yeah. yeah, there's no support for Kotlin and Swift at the moment. It's just Java, Objective C, and Dart. Uh, it's definitely planned. I think it's an issue. Where if you're interested, uh, definitely thumbs up those issues for the Pigeon uh, package to support those languages. Um, but right now, yeah, it's just those. Uh, should be just those three. Now, what if like? If what if I'm like a C developer and I want to actually not write Swift or Kotlin, but what if I wanted to use something else and somehow talk to the native code? Like maybe not even using, like maybe like the typical add function, right? Is there a way I could just somehow write a plugin and then write an add function that just makes a shared library and I could load it in um, without any kind of like Swift or Kotlin? Is there a way to do that? Um, what you could do is. Uh... What is it? Uh, method channels. Method channels usually works is that usually works across languages um, that we support. So you could use Kotlin, Swift, Java, Objective C, but I'm not sure if you can use something like Rust. Um, but I know there's an alternative if it's like C code. You could use Dart FFI, which can like um, interop with C code. 
and you can use like uh, the like code generation for that one as well. Um, outside of like method channels in Dart FFI, I don't think there's yeah a real real process to communicate um, to like a different language outside of those. Something that's like supported by those. I was just thinking about like, if you could do a like instead of because I'm looking at the the Federated plugin right. So mm -hmm. we have a plugin class over here. Is there a way that I could just somehow reference a, a class or a file that's only in C? And then I could I could maybe use the data for file to directly talk with it, or I have to, it seems like I have to have at least some kind of minimum one file or, or something in, in Kotlin or Swift to kind of make this whole thing work. Um so if you have a, the C file and you have like the actual source code, then yeah, you can actually just use um like Dart FFI to communicate directly with it. Obviously, for like communicating with like C code for Android and iOS, there's like more like setup. I think there's like NDK on Android, and then on you have to include the the C code for on like Objective C. But yeah, you should be able to add it without. You should be able to use Dart FFI without needing to uh, add any like specific Java or. Objective C code, just like the setup for whatever platform it is, and whatever that requires. If you're like, even if you like weren't using Flutter, just like setup that's required. Okay. So if, if, I mean, since you have such a long experience working with plugins, right? So if I'm interested in making a plugin, do you have any like tips or tricks that you think uh, I should really know about before I start to code up my plugin? Um, so the matrix. The main trick I would look at is the, a lot, a lot of people have this question. It's like when you start writing a plugin, it's like, how do I write it? And, how, and how do I structure it? Because it's very, still a very open ended question, even for our team. Um, my suggestion is still just to look at the federated plugin models and to look at examples in our repo or other popular third uh, party plugins as well. Um, so I would look at, depending on how complex you want, how complex your plugin is making, I think that's a big thing to decide. So if you're making something that only has like one or two methods, you can look at something like URL launcher um, or something like device info, which is basically just like getting information. It's like one or two methods. Um, same thing with like path provider. But if you're making something like complex, that's like either like camera or video player or like uh, web view flutter, then I would look at these plugins and see how they're structured. Um, especially as we work with web view flutter, um, and once we like finish like this current uh, work on the rewrite, then we'll, we'll probably see like a, a lot easier pa pattern uh, to follow. You also see how to use Pigeon, so you won't have to. Um, so you won't have to like manually write like all the serialization yourself and things like that. Um, so yeah, basically yeah, basically look at the, our examples on our plugins depending on what you're looking for. Look at the simple plugins if you need one or two methods. Look at our complex plugins if you need something more complex. Definitely look um, at WebView Flutter within the coming months um, for like a more streamlined process of how to use like code generation and things like that for a plugin structure. Uh, I'm kind of curious. So like how good is the WebView support? Because I've had people question and ask me, is it possible to use WebView to like make payments kind of bypassing like Apple and Google's little uh, monopoly on the payments through the mobile device? I I'm not sure how payments work through WebView. Um, so I couldn't answer for that specific feature. Um, the support for WebView is definitely um, increased substantially over this year is that we've uh, reduced the amount of bugs and we've added uh, a lot more features, especially within the last um, month or two. And currently we're doing the rewrite so we can add a lot more platform specific features and things like that. So um, it's definitely increased substantially over this year, and it will definitely increase continuing for the next few months, especially how popular the plugin is um, externally and internally. Um, but for the workaround in terms of like the payment stuff, I, I'm not super familiar with how that works for uh, WebView, but the, we do have an in-app purchases plugin that's like decently supported, um, especially with uh, the new features for like StoreKit 2 on Apple that we're going to be adding support for that coming up soon. And then there's also things for like Google billing, I think it's called for their in-app purchases rule. We have people working on that as well and updating it to the latest injury version. Uh, I think I have uh, one last plug, one last, sorry, one last question, which is uh, I haven't worked with the one in Android yet. Uh, sorry, with the one in, with one crib, I guess, the WebView plugin, because there's quite a lot of web WebView plugins mm -hmm. on pub.dev. 
Um, is there like ways that I could actually like hook into the JavaScript and like call dark code from JavaScript and even call JavaScript dark code like that way? Because I saw there's some plugins that have this ability on pub.dev. I was curious if you guys are actually going to support that too. So WebView Flutter also um, currently supports that in a, a limited capacity to where you can add the class called JavaScript channels into essentially you can yeah add a channel and it will call back into your JavaScript code will call back into your uh, dark code whenever or, or it'll you give it a class and it'll make it like a callback um, in the WebView constructor. There's like um, I have to look at it again, but there's like a way to set up multiple like JavaScript channels um, to make callbacks to, and there's like documentation explaining on how to do that. Um, but obviously, we plan on adding more support for that in the future as well. But you definitely can do that with WebView Flutter. I'm not sure about third-party plugins either, how they support it. Um, so I, I couldn't answer for like third-party stuff, but yeah, it definitely works for WebView Flutter. Now, is this supported for all platforms that are supported by Flutter, or is there some platforms you cannot support for WebView? Um, so WebView has the potential to work on any platform, but right now we only support it on Android and iOS. And if you're asking for the JavaScript channel specifically one, then that works for Android and iOS. Okay, perfect. Yeah. I also had another, I had another plugin or I had another thing I was working on before where like I have to have a client sign hello sign through the desktop app, but it didn't work because it seems like most plugins don't have uh, WebView support for desktop. So I just had to open up, you just use URL launcher to open up another URL that was just the workaround, but it worked out pretty well. Yeah, yeah. For depending on uh, what you're doing, URL launcher is definitely um, a better way to go if you're just like needing to open up a browser along those lines. WebView is more like definitely for more lower level support features for like you really want to control um, like the JavaScript and maybe cookies and things like that. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, I don't think I have any more questions. I mean, I, I really, as you can see, I was just abusing you for more information about plugins <laughs> because uh, I'm, I'm working on yeah. a plugin right now and I want to get more into plugins because, you know, people, there's always more and more features being added to like Android and iOS and you guys can't crank up enough fast enough, I think. And that's just a resource issue, not a, a flutter issue necessarily. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so that's, that's, yeah, that's definitely what we're trying to improve as well. We're like, once we start getting code generation in there and we get an architecture, we're going to start definitely sometime next year. We're going to get a lot of documentation on how to structure plugins and how to use code generation to really streamline like the process for people. And then uh, hopefully you'll see a significantly more features. Specifically, um, what we're improving is like adding platform specific features um, for plugins that make that easier to add. And that all starts with like at the federated plugin model and then us improving on that. I'm really looking forward to that because, I mean, the one thing uh, somebody mentioned a while back that, like, basically, if the plugin ecosystem is good in Flutter, then Flutter's good. If it's bad, then Flutter's just bad. And that's just, like, it, it makes sense, right? Because, I mean, yeah. that's just the way it's, like, if you can't use camera, if you can't use these other things, then what you're not really doing very much. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. Like, with Flutter, um, I think it's already, like, fantastic as, like, a UI framework to where, like, creating the UI feels very nice and I really like the structure and like how widgets work and all the support they have for like Material and Cupertino but it's still for an ecosystem there's still like a lot of work to where um, like if you're writing like a camera heavy application that you'll still at this point you still might have to for like a lot of the low level figures you might have to write like platforms a lot of platform specific code and right now what we're working on is trying to, to solve that problem um, to where like you can build and add like a lot of more platform specific features, provide that access to Dart, and then have like a streamlined process for all code generation so we can just like crank out plugins very, very quickly. Um, for, but if yeah. I want to write platform specific stuff, I have to write a plugin or can I just somehow put that into my app? Because I do have platform specific folders, right? Yeah, you, you could. Um, but it can be like for camera specifically, right? If you wanted to add like a feature to camera, like you can't, you'd probably have to do like a, or like extend like our plugin if you want like, like a specific like resolution because like the whole setup for like maintaining the camera and life cycles and taking the picture and running your own plugin um, is probably hard to do within like an application. You could just use like method channels, but most likely for a lot more complex situations, 
you would need like a whole like architecture figured out and things like that. So it's usually easier to like extend a pre-existing plugin. But eventually we basically just wanted to where like all those features just provided in Dart anyways. And so you wouldn't have to write a whole lot of platform specific code and you wouldn't need to like fork a plugin off of GitHub or anything like that. I'm looking forward to that. So mm-hmm. thanks so much for, for coming on. Is there anything you wanted mm-hmm. to give up? Maybe give a shout out to mom or anything while you're, while you're here? Um, uh, my, my mom might watch this, but yeah, I'll give a shout out to her. Um, hopefully people on the Flutter team, um, definitely encouraged to come on to the show. I had a great time having an interview with you, Alan. Um, and definitely, hopefully, yeah, we'll see more Flutter developers and Flutter people, people on the Flutter team out here uh, answering questions and things like that. Yeah, if there's anybody you know who wants to come on, I'm more than happy to have people on. Yeah. So I'm going to have uh, another one of your colleagues coming up pretty soon. As, uh, oh, that's Miriam. Great. Miriam, I think, is going to yeah. be on here. Looking oh, forward awesome. to that. Talking about Flutter yeah. Web because it's... I feel like it, it, they announced it, but then I haven't heard much since then, since the announcement, right? So I'm curious yeah. about what's going on with Flutter Web. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we've always been... Uh, our, our main focus has always been like uh, mobile development. And so yeah, definitely more... Uh, more spotlight on like web and like that, like Linux and Windows would definitely uh, be great for those platforms as well. Cause we definitely do have like great support for those and great team members working on that. Uh, we had Van Dyke on here. I think Van, Van Dyke, I think his name is. Mm-hmm. Uh, I forgot what it, I know it was Van something. Uh, from Ubuntu was on here from Canonical. He was on here talking about oh, their, yeah. their Linux stuff. So I'm way ahead of you. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm always looking for people and I'm trying to talk to Toyota right now to get them on too, because it'd be good to hear about how that's going for them. I think it must be going pretty well because they've been also contributing mm. quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, I heard about Toyota is like uh, writing some stuff for their, uh, their vehicles as well or something along those lines that's using Flutter along those lines. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. The more platforms, um, the better. That's what that we're, that's what we're trying to support and everything. Love it. Again, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, we're gonna have you back again in the future. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Let me know. It was fun. Thanks for having me on. No problem.